Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining our November All America City Promising Practices webinar, Community Wide Visioning with an Equity Lens. My name is Rebecca Trout, and I am the director of the All America City Award Program here at the National Civic League. I'm joined today by my colleague, Carla Kimbrough, who is our Racial Equity Program Director. The National Civic League is, is a 125-year-old nonprofit, and we aim to advance civic engagement to create equitable and thriving communities. AAC is our flagship program, and it began in 1949 to recognize exceptional civic engagement and local government. AAC not only celebrates great work, but we also aim to share the innovative practices and initiatives around the country through avenues such as this monthly webinar series. Before we begin, I just want to briefly touch on the 2019 All-America City Award before we turn it over to our presenters. So in 2019, um, we will be recognizing 10 communities for their inclusive engagement processes, exemplary projects, and work to create a healthy community. Applications are required to include at least one project focused on the 2019 highlighted topic, which is creating healthy communities through inclusive civic engagement. We're looking for projects that demonstrate inclusive decision-making processes that create healthy communities for all, and particularly for populations currently experiencing poor health outcomes. So without any further ado, I'm excited to turn this over to our great presenters who are both the 2018 AAC winning, winning communities. We will first begin with Decatur, Georgia, and we have Linda Harris, who is the Chief Civic Engagement and Education and Communications Officer at the City of Decatur, as well as Renee Madison, who is the Communications Specialist with the City of Decatur. After they are um, finished, we will turn it over to San Antonio. We have Maria Cox, who is the President and CEO of the SA 2020 Initiative as well as Alex Lopez, who is the San Antonio's Chief Equity Officer. All right, Decatur, if you can go ahead and kick us off, we'll get okay. going. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, welcome to our Better Together presentation. We're here today to talk about the City of Decatur's Community Action Plan for Equity, Inclusion, and Engagement that outlines 60 action items for individuals, organizations, and local government to undertake to cultivate a more just, welcoming, inclusive, equitable, and compassionate experience for all who live, visit, or work here. We started with two questions. What is government's role in creating a space for community dialogue across differences? And how do we bring everyone to the table? especially those who do not feel welcome or included. So I'm Linda Harris, and I'll spend the first 10 minutes talking about why we created the plan, how we created the plan, and who we involved. Then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Renee Madison, who will talk about how we began to implement the plan and what we are doing on an ongoing basis related to equity, inclusion, and engagement. So first, the why. There were several factors that led to the creation of this plan. We are a welcoming city with Welcoming America. We signed the charter to be a compassionate city. We were losing our diversity with many older African Americans being replaced with young, predominantly white families and families of other ethnicities with high incomes. But the bottom line was that we had received several complaints of racial profiling by our police. We believe in the power of civic engagement, so we designed a year-long community-wide visioning process that ultimately included approximately 800 diverse citizens who contribute over 1,300 hours, making it the largest citizen participation process since the 2010 strategic plan. So next, the how and the who. We hired a consultant trained specifically in the issues of equity and inclusion and who was also a Decatur resident. She's pictured on the right of this slide. We then invited a group of 19 residents and business people, which we called the Leadership Circle, to work together to design a community visioning process to engage the community more deeply in conversations across differences and to intentionally reach out to include everyone, particularly those who might feel marginalized and not welcome at the table. 
Members of the leadership circle were intentionally diverse and brought different perspectives to the table. For example, the police chief and one of the community members who had accused the police of racial profiling both served. Other perspectives included a middle school guidance counselor who was also Jewish, a black Muslim mother of teenagers who was a program director for a leadership program for teens, a Caucasian city staff member who was a native of Decatur and who was at Decatur High during integration, a communications and marketing director married to a Latino immigrant, an African-American male who was paraplegic, and more. The group represented faith-based organizations, different sexual orientations, the school system, city staff, millennials, Gen Xers, baby boomers, business owners, students, educational institutions, nonprofit leaders, consultants, ministers, and more. Members of the leadership circle met for almost a year, had their own conversations across differences, and created a community outreach plan that included Decatur's established successful communications outlets for engaging community members. And the circle also reviewed the current practices with an eye toward equity and intentionally designed additional communication strategies that targeted different audiences, including seniors, the Somali community, and teens. The leadership circle did a community survey and 724 people participated. They held a working across differences training session for volunteers interested in supporting the process as volunteer, um, volunteers that drew 70 people. And finally, the leadership circle hosted a day-long community conversation across differences that drew 250 people on a Saturday for five hours. And that resulted in the Better Together Community Action Plan for Equity, Inclusion, and Engagement. The City Commission accepted the plan in December of 2015. It spans a three-year period and contains actions for individuals, organizations, and government to take. So now I'm going to turn it over to Renee to bring it forward to 2018. Thanks, Linda. So the Decatur City Commission, they established the Better Together Advisory Board a year after um, adopting the Community Action Plan. And this group of folks, they were in position to guide and advise the commission and the community around issues of equity, inclusion, and engagement. We had such a great response that what would have typically been a nine-member board ended up being a 13-member board, which included a high school student. And we also had three staff liaisons and a senior advisor. The board is responsible for assisting city staff, I'm sorry, the board is responsible for providing recommendations regarding the implementation of the Better Together Community Action Plan. Really taking a look at the focus areas and figuring out ways to make those areas come to life while also supporting established programs and organizations in the community working to promote a more just, welcoming, inclusive, equitable, and compassionate city. The group has worked to convene the community partners that were identified through, through the initial process to update them on the initiative, give feedback on the work that they are doing, and figuring out ways to connect with these folks throughout the year. And in this photo, this is one of our meetings with our community partners to update them on what the board has been doing. The board is also responsible for assisting the city staff with public education and outreach activities that promote equity, inclusion, and engagement. And currently, some of the things that we're doing is hosting community conversations, uh, hosting racial equity workshops, and supporting our community partners in any way possible. So we've hosted a community conversation around being a welcoming community. And we partner with a resident who had a, a photo project called We Are Decatur and telling the stories or, of different residents throughout the city. We also partner with one of our partners, Welcoming America, who is based here in Decatur during Welcoming Week, hosting a Welcoming Day kickoff on the square and inviting everyone in the community and also tying that in 
to the We Are Decatur project and inviting all of those participants out and having some of the, those participants to share their stories with the community. The board is also responsible for assisting in the development of a strategic integrated outreach plan in order to involve the broad spectrum of community members in cycle life, in city life, I'm sorry. And so what we did with, we had a back to school movie bash in August. And in order to reach out to our Somali population, we connected with one of the community members who assisted us in translating our flyer into their language. Because one thing that we thought about is we, a lot of the parents depend on the children who speak English to translate the information to them. And we really wanted to make sure that the parents understood what was happening. And so we, we wanted to take it a step further and be able to put it, the information in a way that they can understand it. We also work with um, a company to help us translate our events into Spanish. And so just being very deliberate about reaching out to different um, cultures in our community. The board has also taken on the initiative to look at a lot of holidays that are celebrated or national days. We, we look at a calendar that have a number of different days, Bully Awareness Month or um, Native American Heritage Month, and we, we partner with one of our bookstores, Little Shop of Stories on, in Decatur Square, and they assist us in selecting books related to these topics. And we take these books and we put the information out in our monthly newsletter that um, is distributed to every home and business within our 4.4 square miles. And we also share that information on social media. The board is continuing to work on a number of different plans and, and ideas and events to make sure that we are following through with the Better Together Community Action Plan and the points in the focus areas, but also looking at things that are coming up every day in our everyday lives and making sure that we are being equitable and inclusive. And so here, here are a couple of links that you can go to to find out more information on the initial Better Together process and see the Community Action Plan, and also a link to the Better Together Advisory Board and some of the initiatives that we are currently working on, and we're constantly updating those. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda and Renee. Uh, the work that you guys are doing to be deliberately inclusive by doing things such as translating materials is, is truly impressive. I really appreciate you sharing that with all of us. Um, we will have a moment for questions. If you can just ask any questions through the chat box on your screen, we will ask those and answer those at the end. Um, and then now I'm going to pass us along to Molly Cox, who is going to begin the San Antonio presentation. Yeah, thank you so much um, I, uh, for having us and for also giving us an opportunity to talk about San Antonio. Um, uh, I'm going to begin with a little bit of background, and then I will toss over to Alex, who works inside the city. So I'm going to kind of give a big broad brush stroke of what we're doing here and then allow Alex to get sort of uh, more specific and granular about how the city plays a, a role inside this ecosystem that we've created. Back in 2010, San Antonio embarked on a community-wide visioning process um, sort of under the uh, auspices of asking a question of where do we want to be in the next 10 years? And um, we very specifically asked, like, how can we change our city? What do we want to keep uh, and preserve and maintain? What might we want to do better? Um, and we had nearly 6,000 people participate in a community-wide visioning process, one of our most successful uh, engagement processes here in San Antonio. And um, those nearly 6,000 people came together and said, this is where we want our city to go. This is how we would measure whether or not our city was moving towards the vision 
uh, we have outlined for ourselves, and then we moved. Um, what you see on your screen right now is the overview of what is now known as San Antonio's community vision. Uh, it's pretty sweeping and bold. Basically, within 10 years, we would be the healthiest residents with quality education and connected neighborhoods, a respectful steward of our natural resources with a uh, vibrant downtown and a creative community and a local government that's responsive and accountable. But that last sentence that's there that, again, was written by our community at large, our entire community takes responsibility for our collective well-being, is how we ground our work in San Antonio, Texas. What's a tiny bit different, I think, than other community-wide visioning processes that have occurred across the United States is um, in San Antonio, rather than just doing the community-wide visioning process and then handing the report and the vision and the desire to track um, measures of success over to our city government or a mayor's office, uh, we developed a nonprofit organization. Um, SA 2020 is the organization I am proud to run. It is a nonprofit who drives progress toward the shared vision of a thriving San Antonio. Our job specifically is to work in systems change. Um, understanding equitable outcomes can only be achieved if we're actually actively working together to achieve the community vision we wrote for ourselves. Um, we're a staff of five, so it's giant, um, and we do our work in sort of three very specific ways. We put out an annual progress report on the community vision itself, uh, showing exactly where we are um, on each of the indicators, 61 community indicators that we track. We uh, engage the public actively all the time in systems change work, meeting people where they are in nonprofit organizations and businesses, policymakers and public institutions, asking them to align their efforts to our community vision at large. And we um, do the alignment work very specifically, working internally within organizations to help them see how they could also be advancing equity specifically leading with race. This question of how do you make the greatest impact towards our vision is very important to us. Um, we believe truly that if we are to take collective responsibility for our collective well-being, then it is all of our responsibility to identify um, what we do um, to make the greatest impact. Um, SA 2020, or what our work ultimately in alignment, really does sort of show how San Antonio is operating on sort of a very large scale systems change work. There are nearly, there are over 160 nonprofit, foundation, public, and corporate part partners who are currently aligning their micro efforts to the community vision. SA 2020 then tracks their efforts, aligning it right, to community results measured by our 61 community indicators and reports annually on what's doing well and what's not doing so well. This gives us a bird's eye view of where in San Antonio we need to double down efforts and where we can take best practices and learn from them. I'm going to use just the city of San Antonio very specifically, and then obviously Alex will talk more generically about what they're doing in their efforts within the city of San Antonio. If you look at the City of San Antonio's mission, we deliver quality services and commit to achieve San Antonio's vision of prosperity. Uh, we bolded that sentence because it's incredibly important that in San Antonio, the community at large actually wrote what they believed was the vision of prosperity. Um, we have a community vision that a nonprofit actually aligns all of our efforts towards. Every day we should be thinking about what the community says we should be doing. We should have um, the healthiest residents in the United States. We should have economic prosperity and educational opportunity for everyone. And it is our job to make sure that every institution is driving that community vision and playing a piece, a role in that every day. On your screen is a 61 community indicators that SA 2020 tracks. 
Uh, the vast majority of them identified in the original visioning process in 2010. Th these have been shifted and changed throughout the course of the last eight years based on measuring and what sources are available, what would tell a better picture. Um, there's no need to know all 61 of these indicators. I'm the lucky one that gets these all in my brain. Um, uh, but you can see which ones are moving towards the goal where the red star is at the top and which ones are moving in the opposite direction. What you'll also see are some very uh, serious challenges just based on the way that the measures are moving up or down. Um, and it gives us opportunities to ask more questions. Why, for example, is transportation doing so poorly? And then why might that affect our jobs indicator? Why could that potentially then influence education or family well-being or even our health or neighborhoods? And over the course of the last several years, we have worked very specifically with the city to identify, particularly in infrastructure, um, transportation, sustainability, where they may be doubling down in policy to help us shift uh, the way our city is moving um, in areas like transportation and uh, housing affordability, connectivity, health parks access, walkability. At SA 2020, we believe very strongly in um, sharing a yes and story. We believe that we need to uphold our successes, um, celebrate those. This is San Antonio, for better or for worse. We are the fastest growing city in the United States, second in millennial job, uh, millennial growth. Millennial college educated students are coming here to San Antonio. Um, we are number two in the nation for cybersecurity. Um, we are over 60% Latino in population, the sixth best city in America, one of my favorites to, to tout. Sorry to all the other cities, but not sorry. Um, we've worked very diligently to make this map happen in San Antonio. Because we outlined a vision for our future, we knew we needed to recruit more people for jobs. And we knew that we would be growing. In fact, we will nearly double our population in the next 20 years. This is San Antonio completely. And also this is San Antonio, where we are second in the nation for college-educated millennial growth. We are also top in the nation for income segregation. One in six of our residents live in poverty. One in five children do. Our municipal voter turnout is at 13%, which seems abysmal. And is actually pretty bad, only it's more than doubled over the course of the last several years. We are diligently working to shift this map as well, because we said that we wanted to reduce poverty and increase college attainment, that we wanted to see um, our residents not living in poverty, that our income segregation would shift exponentially. Uh, and we did it because together we developed a vision for the future of our community, and we actively align and engage every single day, knowing that if we reach the vision for our city of San Antonio, then equitable outcomes will be there for everyone. This is us generally, um, if you have questions or want to find out more. And then I'm going to turn it over to Alex to talk more specifically about the city. Thank you, Molly. Um, I think what's most impressive about the, about SA 2020 is that you didn't just stop at creating the vision, but continue to engage the public throughout the implement, implementation and evaluation plan. Um, and now I will hand this over to Alex, who is going to begin the second part of their presentation. However, uh, this focus has evolved over the past couple of years. Going back to 2013, our city council amended our non-discrimination ordinance to include protections for gender identity, sexual orientation, and veteran status. The Diversity and Inclusion Office was created in 2015 to serve as a clearinghouse for discrimination complaints 
but most importantly, to incorporate a culture of inclusion throughout the organization. In 2016, the scope of the office was expanded to promote equity in the development and implementation of city processes. And the best practice for embedding equity into local government in, uh, really focuses in three areas. First, we normalize the work, implementing a shared understanding and definition. Because the work of local government ranges so vastly, it's also important to prioritize and to act with urgency. We then move on into organizing our resources, building the necessary internal infrastructure to support the concepts we've learned, and partnering across organizations and with our community. Lastly, we operationalize these concepts by using equity tools and start with data to develop strategies and drive results. Our focus on equity is still relatively new, but we are proud of the accomplishments we've, we've seen to date. Last spring, we partnered with the Government Alliance on Race and Equity and provided training for all city executives on implicit bias and how local governments can advance equity in our communities. We launched a pilot program where we provided more in-depth training and helped departments understand how equity can be incorporated into our operations. These departments applied the concepts to specific programs. So for example, the library looked at children and teen services, and the human services department looked at our Head Start program. This pilot was valuable because it helped us understand the importance of normalizing the work, making sure that we're all on the same page. But we also learned more about the type of support departments need to operationalize this work. At, right around when we were finishing that project, at that same time, we received policy direction from the City Council to develop the fiscal year 2018 budget using an equity lens, which we did. Most notably in our street maintenance program, where we focused resources to improve our street infrastructure in areas that, of greatest need. We also applied this concept in other areas of work, including the Animal Care Services Department and our Tree Canopy Program where we disaggregated data to get a better understanding of the needs in our community and the impact of our investments. In fiscal year 2018, we applied equity impact assessments to six high impact initiatives, ranging from social service funding to street maintenance, land use planning associated with housing options and neighborhood engagement. Through this process, for example, the government and public affairs department identified that in previous years, our SA Speak Up uh, campaign respondents did not reflect their population by race, gender, age, or council district. And SA Speak Up is our annual budget community input uh, campaign. So once they identified the, um, the lack of response from certain populations, they redefined their strategies and prioritized increasing the participation in the campaign, but specifically um, within historically underrepresented demographics. So in order to complete these assessments, we actually partnered with SA2020 to train approximately 100 city staff and community leaders on advancing equity, our equity impact assessment tool, and communicating equity for impact. Um, we are an initial supporter of SA2020, and now that you've seen the background on the, the visioning process and the role that um, the vision itself and the organization still plays in our community. It, it was a very logical connection for us to partner with them as we look at data and, and also try to drive these outcomes through the day-to-day -day work that the city um, provides our community. So it was just a really quick overview of what we do internally within the organization. Um, and I'm, we're, that concludes my part of the presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. I uh, appreciate you sharing your accomplishments with us. And now I think we are going to open up to a couple of questions um, that have come through the chat, and those are going to be asked by our, our uh, Carla Kimbrough. Hi, everyone. Uh, one of the questions that came is from, is for Decatur. And that question is, what kind of resistance occurred in the community as you were proceeding and developing your plan, and how did you handle that or address the, uh, the difficulties there? 
Um, we, <clears throat> there were some people who totally understood what we were trying to do, and then there were some people who were, let me, what's the nice word here? Um, they were totally resistant to it. They said they were welcoming. They didn't know. They didn't need to have a consultant come in. Um, and they were typically the ones that already felt welcome at the table. And there was some pushback with our city commissioners on how much money we were spending because we paid a consultant similar to what we paid our consultants to do our other plans. And um, they, the, the city commission held firm and um, was strong and felt like that this was an important initiative for the city to take and that, um, that I think that, that sums it up. Well, since you, since you mentioned the topic of budget, how much does an initiative like this cost? Um, we we paid the consultant a, a, about $125,000. Um, we we had a little bit more when we, we did a, the lunch. You know, it, so I guess overall the budget was probably $150,000, but we got $25,000 from the Community um, Foundation of Atlanta who gave us $25,000 for um, specifically for civic engagement into reaching, um, uh, intentionally reaching everybody. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question for San Antonio. Can you tell us about any of the exciting uh, decisions that came out of the equity work with any of the city departments? Yeah, so there was, yeah, I mean, there, was some, sorry, there was some interesting findings um, when you start looking at the data and you see um, how different communities are experiencing different outcomes. You can, um, the, the departments really, it was just about helping them understand that and they were able to identify how they could change things. I mentioned the library, you know, they were really talking about how um, fines and fees are assessed specifically for children and teens um, trying to access library services and materials. You know, if the, the fines and fees really weren't, you know, they, they were becoming an obstacle in some situations and um, not really, you know, contributing from a financial perspective in a way that was meaningful. So I, I think that's where they started looking at where their practices create these burdens on some of our populations. Um, that was one example. I know Molly worked with, in great depth with our human services department and looking at the data and the impact that our social service agencies make in our community and the funding that the city specifically puts towards some of those services and how we can best um, align those services um, to drive some of the outcomes that we wanted to see a little bit more intentionally and specifically. Yeah, if I can- But we found something compelling was showing them the data. Yeah, if I can um, piggyback on that, I think what was really interesting as well about working with the Department of Human Services was this idea, right, that we had aligned um, the city of San Antonio, our local community foundation, and our local United Way, um, to, again, towards our community vision saying, if this is where we wanna go, let's figure this out. And DHS, the Department of Human Services through the city of San Antonio, ultimately identified in multiple spaces across their programs that they were really working in certain zip codes. Um, and if they could shore up the amount of um, uh, funding for their nonprofit partners in those areas, what they would start to see potentially is a shift in outcomes in those particular areas. And by aligning with our community foundation and our local United Way, they were able to have a conversation about if the city was looking more at, for example, preventative measures, then could uh, our community foundation really be working on intervention measures? Um, and could they really be um, uh, partnering in a better way to achieve better equitable outcomes in the zip codes that they were really focusing in on? So I think what we started to see very specifically um, was this idea of, again, in alignment, how, where, what lanes are we all in and are we actually um, doing a, a good baton toss or a good baton pass as opposed to 
sort of running parallel to each other. Great. Well, can you also talk about San Antonio, how you were able to get so many nonprofit organizations involved in this work? Yeah, I mean, I think we, I, I think I'm not wrong to say um, nonprofits are the backbones of many of our communities who are doing the work that can't be done by government and potentially won't be done by our private sector. And um, I think that nonprofit organizations every single day are working towards outcomes in their own work and have challenges in identifying and communicating that impact. Um, and that's because of this bizarre tension we have with city governments and private funders who um, are asking for sort of um, outputs rather than outcomes um, and funding programs rather than outcomes. Um, the conversation that we're having locally in San Antonio is, if we believe in the community vision that our community wrote, then can we stop asking for program um, deliverables and can we start working together in partnership on the outcomes we wish to achieve? So, for example, when the City of San Antonio's Department of Human Services shifted from, we fund uh, programs that uh, help, uh, who do, I, I, child abuse prevention, you should serve 50 kids, and they started saying, we want to reduce child abuse over the course of the next two years by 10%. You tell us how you do that, and let's track that. It changes the, the tenor with which this tension between the nonprofit sector and the funding sector operates. Secondarily to that is nonprofits consistently, we have over 130 nonprofit partners, are consistently telling us that their biggest challenges are in evaluation, data analysis, and communicating impact. Um, and because of the work that we do at SA 2020, that is our best, that's what we bring to the table. How can we better help you look at your data to understand how your programs are impacting people's lives? How can we help you better evaluate that information? And then how can we better help you tell people the impact that you're having on the community at large? Um, we have yet to see a nonprofit resist uh, working with us in shoring up their evaluation measures or looking at their data. Um, what we have seen is nonprofits speak very specifically about not having the capacity both in personnel and in technology. And so our, because of where we sit in the community, we're able then to take that information to a funder and say, this isn't about a lack of trying or a, um, a misalignment of outcomes. This is about um, having a different conversation about funding. Like rather than funding a program manager and only 50 children, start funding an outcome, which means then, right, funding infrastructure and operations and management and data systems uh, and trainings. Um, and that conversation has, I think, shored up more over the course of the last year and a half or two than it has in the eight years that we've been in operation. Great. Thank you. Decatur, can someone talk about how you all were able to involve nonprofit organizations in the work that you're doing there? Sure. So we have a number of non nonprofits within the city that are actively doing work around equity. And when they heard about this, this process, they were really energized about it and really excited to have um, the, the advisory board and the city as a resource. And even through the initial process, and Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, we have a number of people that were involved in the process that are connected to these nonprofits or have been um, involved in a number of initiatives around equity and inclusion and were able to help point us in the direction of creating um, an asset map. And then on our asset map, we have over 200 uh, organizations that we connect with, and we support them in any way that we can. And I think what we did was bring them to the table. We opened a community conversation where people could share what they were doing, 
and when once they heard that somebody else was doing something, they got energized in talking to each other because they had not been at the table together. So we brought everybody together, and that um, that was um, a great uh, a great plus for all of us. And and even with the initiative of keeping them energized or keeping the conversation going with them, they understand that we are committed to this and we do want to work with them and we want to make sure that we know what they have going on so we can share it with our community. And so they are they're, they are more excited to stay involved and they're not hesitant to share with us um, some of the information of what they have going on or even reaching out to us and say, hey, can you help me with this or can you help me get the word out with this or um, would you all mind partnering with us? Thank you for that. And to uh, sort of piggyback back off of that question, um, you mentioned earlier that, that you involve some traditionally um, uninvolved uh, groups and organizations. Can you talk about if there was any hesitancy by either those individuals or those groups and, and any distrust in being involved in this process? So I think throughout the process, there there was, even if we didn't see it, there was some hesitation, right? So it's, it took a lot of, it's taken a lot of trust building to say, hey, we actually want you to be a part of this, and not just this initiative, but we want you to be a part of everything that we have going on. Um, and I can understand why people would be hesitant because it's like, oh, we're talking about e equity and inclusion. Now you want to reach out to me. You want to make sure that I'm involved so you can have my face in the building. And it's more than that. It's we want to engage you. We want to get you involved and get your perspective because the, this community is for all of us, and it takes all of us to make it a great place and a place that we all want to be. And we had some initial resistance, even with the Better Together Advisory Board, after we created the plan, because it was like, okay, now you have this plan, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to really involve us? And so our Better Together Advisory Board had a, had a conversation about it, or what are we going to do? What is important here? And sort of each of us pledged to take it on, and in our own way, even a lot of it's just face to face and talking to people and, and going back and being there and um, being consistent. Wonderful, that's great advice. And I have sort of a final question for, for both communities. Can you talk a little bit about how you keep this work going beyond the plan? Sure, well, this is Decatur. Um, again, we have our Better Together Advisory Board and just really making sure that we are not only touching on the focus areas and the points in the plan, but really keeping an eye and an ear out to what is happening within our community now, what issues people have, what concerns people are bringing up, and really engaging in those conversations, and not just with the community, looking internally, what, are, what can we do internally to make sure that we are being equitable um, we, we, as I mentioned in our slides, we've been doing racial equity workshops, and now that we've done those racial equity workshops, what's next? What, how can we move forward with that? Because again, this plan is not just something that we're checking off a box. This is a continuing breathing thing, and in order for us to continue to engage our community and continue to maintain that trust, we have to show folks that we are committed to this and we are going to continue to work on it and um, work together to make sure that our community is a place for everyone. So in, yeah, I think, in um, Antonio, I think internally within the, the city organization, it, it's really been, like you just mentioned, a lot of training and making sure that, you know, we've trained at this point maybe a couple hundred city staff, but we've got, you know, 12,000, 13,000 city employees. So really normalizing more of our equity work um, because it, it is absolutely true. Community, we build trust by, by demonstrating um, in our day-to-day -day work that we understand and that, and that we can incorporate these concepts um, so that our residents can actually see us doing this, this work and, and trying to drive these more equitable outcomes. But it's about helping our staff understand um, those institutional barriers and those 
those unintended um, situations that that unfortunately still exist, and and arming them with the ability to um, call them when they see them, and um, recommend changes, recommend and implement changes to policies and programs and service delivery. You know, I appreciate um, the question a lot, particularly when you're a community visioning process, right? Like we got started in 2010 under a mayor who hasn't, who's not here, right? Julian Castro was our mayor at the time. And typically when a process like this begins and it gets touted by a mayor, by the next administration, this goes away. And I think what was, is really interesting in San Antonio is having a community visioning process that the community still lauds as its own. We're on our third administration now. Um, and SA 2020 is still at the forefront of people's brains, um, used as a community vision to hold up and sort of align towards. We have our annual report that will come out again in, 2009, in January of 2019. Um, we'll use 2019 to continue to align around complex community challenges. And then in 2020, we will embark on a pretty rigorous process of reconvening, um, reaffirming, um, our community vision so that in 2021, when we release our 2020 report, we'll be able to say, and here's where we go for the next 10 years. So I think, you know, the way in which we did our process of engagement by keeping the public continuously engaged has allowed us to sort of shake off this notion that a community vision process that's been tagged or named by one administration can't be upheld by the public at large. So that's kind of cool. That's great. It's wonderful to hear that it's gone through administrations. Well, I think those are all the questions that we have received through the chat. And I really want to thank uh, both Decatur and in San Antonio for sharing their experiences and expertise on community engagement and visioning. And we will be sending out a recording as well as the PowerPoint presentation for this webinar to everyone who has registered. Um, and if you have any additional questions, you can feel free to email me at aac at ncl.org. And for now, that will conclude our time together, and we hope to see you guys on our next webinar, which will be in December. Thank you.